For this next unit entitled Paul and the Law, we're shifting gears a little bit from our uh, previous lectures. In the past, and indeed most of the uh, units in our course, we're, uh, we're moving from the then and there of the text to the here and now of today. As I illustrate, hopefully for you, the reformed hermeneutic of approaching scripture grammatically, literarily, um, historically, and theologically. But for this uh, series of presentations on Paul and the Law, we prejudice, we pay special attention to the theological element in our hermeneutic. Theological because we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. In this case, especially comparing Paul with Paul. We're trying to look at his letters as a whole and to discern whether he has a coherent view on the topic of the law. And uh, this subject is an important one uh, uh, for uh, us and for students of the New Testament. You can see here a quote from George Eichholz, a German theologian, who says, One can hardly understand Paul's theology if one does not grasp his theology of the Torah. And that's not a hyperbole, that's not an overstatement, because the topic of the law involves things like uh, the relationship of law to gospel, to, you know, of works to grace, the relationship between the Old and the New uh, Testaments and covenants. And so there are a lot of key themes that uh, are connected with this topic on Paul and the law. And like most things that are very important, they're not always so uh, easy or simple or clear. It's also complicated. And the difficulty for us is exacerbated by the fact that Paul makes differing statements about the law, differing statements that are also seemingly contradictory. And as a result of this, uh, the church and biblical scholars have been wrestling and talking with Paul's view on the law for a long, long time. And the situation has only gotten worse in the past 20 years or so, ever since the rise of the so-called new perspective on Paul. But all that to say is that uh, the subject on Paul and the law is an important one, well worthy of our attention, but also a complicated one. And that means that it's going to take us a little while through our readings and through these presentations to... Uh, think uh, carefully about uh, what the church has said in the past and what our position should be on Paul's understanding of the Torah of the law. So in this first section I want to illustrate for you the problem not just so that you know it intellectually but you so to say feel uh, the problem that you and I face as interpreters of Paul and his letters and I said it a minute ago and I'm gonna say it here and that is that Paul makes differing statements about the law there's no question that that's the case right he makes statements that aren't all exactly the same and what's more not only are they different they are seemingly contradictory the word seemingly is important for me because I hope to show that ultimately Paul's statements are not contradictory, that Paul does have a coherent view of the law, but they, at first blush anyway, do appear to be at odds with each other, and so that's the question, that's the issue, that's the trouble that we have to uh, try to solve. Now, a few illustrations of these differing and seemingly contradictory statements. So the first illustration has to do with a series of statements in which Paul seems to speak quite strongly, quite unequivocally, about the fact that we have either been freed from the law or we've died to the law. So Romans 6.14, for example, For you are not under law, but under grace. Or Romans 7.4 and 6, so that... My brothers, you have also died to the law. You have been discharged from the law, having died to that which held us captive. And it's not just Romans. Galatians also has similarly strong statements. Paul says in 2.9, For through the law I died to the law. And so if, if all we had in Paul's letters were statements like this, well then there really wouldn't be a problem. Uh, we would probably be Lutheran. We would say, why are we even wasting our time talking about the law? That's so yesterday. That's so Old Testament. We're New Testament, New Covenant kind of people. Been there and done that. But the trouble is, Paul doesn't only say these kind of things. He also makes a number of statements which suggest that in his mind, there is an ongoing role for the law in the Christian's life. There is a normative role that the law still plays in the life of followers of Jesus. And so you can see statements like Romans 3.31. 
Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? And then in the strongest way possible in Greek, me genoito, absolutely not. God forgive it. Right? On the contrary, we uphold the law. A Romans 8.4 is an important verse where Paul says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Paul assumes that the Roman Christians, that you and I, will indeed in our day-to-day -day conduct fulfill, that is, obey the law. And you can see other texts also from Galatians 6.2 and Ephesians 6.2. And so the, the challenge is, how, how can the same guy say, these, uh, say both things? Uh, which one is true, Paul? Have we died to the law? Are we set free from the law? Or does the law really still have an ongoing place in our lives as followers of Jesus? A second illustration, and, and here the tension maybe you would say is not so great, but you have to realize that there are a lot of New Testament scholars who aren't so sympathetic to an evangelical or more positive reading of Paul, and so they take some of these statements and they maybe magnify them, they highlight their differences. But it is true that Paul in 722, for example, uh, connects the law with God, right? He says, I delight in God's law, right? It's God's law, right? He's the one who authored it, right? It originated with him. And same thing in Romans 8, 7, right? Uh, it does not submit to God's law. But in at least one other text, in Galatians 3.19, Paul seems to distance God from the law, or God's hand in the law. He stresses instead that the law came through an intermediary, right, in some sense. And some people have seen that there is a tension in Paul's statements between these two ideas. A third example has to do with uh, terminology or vocabulary. Paul often uses the word for law, which in Greek is nomos, and uh, opposite of that, he highlights either the word pistis, faith, or the word Christos, Christ. So in one verse, you'll have a reference to the law, usually in a negative way, and then in the next verse, or in the second half of the same verse, usually with an adversative, a contrastive verb or, or, or particle between, Paul will set the law over against faith and or Christ. And you can see some examples there in uh, Romans and Galatians. But in a couple of examples, Paul takes law and, again, either faith or Christ, which are normally at odds with each other, and instead brings them intimately close together in the same breath. Um, he, he talks about the law of faith, for example, in Romans 3.27, or in both 1 Corinthians 9 and Galatians 6, he talks about the law of Christ. And some people rightly ask the question, Paul, how can you do that? How can you take these two ideas, these terms that normally or elsewhere in your writings are at odds with each other, and now bring them intimately together? Romans 10.4 isn't so much a, an example of contradiction, or apparent contradiction, as it is of ambiguity. Paul makes a statement, uh, it seems like an important summary statement about the law. He says that Christ is the telos of the law. And the trouble is, telos can have uh, two different meanings. It can have the meaning end, in the sense of come to an end and is no more. Or it can have the idea of end, in the sense of reaching a climax, a sense of fulfillment. But then that doesn't mean that that thing doesn't have some ongoing, continuous role. So, for example, um, one day you hope to reach the telos of your studies of your program here at Calvin Theological Seminary. One day you hope to graduate and walk across the stage. Now, that could mean the end of your studying, study no more, or what more, more likely means, hopefully means, okay, you reach a certain climax, right, when you graduate, when you complete all your studies, but that by no means doesn't imply that you won't continue to learn, that you won't continue to study, that you won't continue to be involved in ongoing education. And so here we have a bit of ambiguity about which one of these meanings Paul has in mind when he talks about Christ being the telos of the law. Another example of uh, confusion, possible contradiction, has to do with the meaning of the word namos itself. 
most often, uh, by a vast, vast percentage of time, the word namos refers to the Mosaic law. Although, even there, there is some ambiguity whether Paul is using the Mosaic law in a very narrow sense, referring to the Ten Commandments, or broader than that, referring to the Sinaic Covenant, Exodus 19 through uh, 24, or the whole five books of the Pentateuch, right, the books of uh, Moses. But generally speaking, with this slight nuance, normally nomos has this idea of referring to the law, right? The law that was given through Moses. But in a couple of verses, Paul uses the same word nomos in a different way. For example, 7.21 in Romans, Paul says, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Most Roman commentators look at that verse and say, Paul isn't talking about a law at work that is some Old Testament verse or commandment at work in his body. No, here they say that Paul is using the word nomos as a principle or a power. What Paul is saying instead, they think in this verse, is that there is a power at work within him. There is a principle, a force at work within him, which doesn't allow him to do the good that he wanted to do. And, and sometimes this difference in meaning between almost can be found right in the same, not same letter, same passage, but almost back to back in different verses. So for example, in Romans 8 verses 2 and 3, both of the verses make reference to nomos, but almost all scholars think that nomos in verse 2 is different than nomos in verse 3. First of all, just to read the text, it goes like this, literally, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was unable to do, and that it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and a sin offering and so forth. Now, almost all scholars uh, assert that in, 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 in Romans 8, verse 2, Namos does not refer to the Mosaic law. Paul is not saying the law of the spirit of life. He's not saying there's some kind of Old Testament Mosaic command connected with the spirit. And that Old Testament command connected with the spirit has somehow set him free from another Old Testament command connected with sin and death. Again, most would see here that Paul is using the word nomos as some kind of power. And what Paul is contrasting then in verse 2 are two powers at work. One is the power of the Holy Spirit, and the other is the power of sin, which leads to death. And Paul makes a very important statement. He says that the one power is stronger or greater than the other power. He says that the, the power at work in us through the Holy Spirit has set us free from this other power, this power of sin, which only leads to death. But then the very next verse, verse 3, Paul says, For what the law was unable to do, and that it was weakened by the flesh, here he shifts, seemingly, back to his normal use of nomos, as again, a reference to the Mosaic law. And that's also found in the next verse, 8 verse 4, which comes right after that, which we read just a minute ago, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us. And so uh, some have accused Paul of being inconsistent, even contradictory, because nomos means one thing most of the time, but a, a few other occasions nomos can mean uh, something else. Yet another illustration is, uh, is this. Paul refers to the law in a very positive way in Romans 7. He says the law is holy, the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. But yet, in chapter 7, the very same chapter, Paul takes the law and he connects it with sin and brings these things so closely together that, well, um, somehow the law seems tainted by its close connection with sin. If you read Paul carefully, the law not only teaches me my sin, but more than that, it takes my sin and makes my sin more sinful. And even more than that, if you read chapter 7 carefully, somehow the law almost uh, causes my sin. It almost is a catalyst for my sinful conduct. And so how can that be? Is the law on the one hand holy, just, and good, as you assert with one breath, or is it somehow so closely connected with sin that maybe it's not so holy, righteous, and good? Yet another example is Paul claims that no one can obey the law. Right? For no human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law. But yet in other places, Paul seems to suggest, now of course he does so in a more apologetic way, he's defending himself, but, but he seems to suggest that with regard to the law, he led actually a quite 
perfect life. In Philippians 3, verse 6, he says of himself, As for legalist or legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. And in Romans 2, Paul seems to suggest that um, the Gentiles who don't have the nomos, who don't have the law, often do what the law says. And he contrasts that with the Jews who do have the law and don't do what it says. And so again, some have seen a tension here between, on the one hand, the claim that no one can perfectly obey the law, and then perhaps an example of Paul, who points to his pre-conversion life and his so-called faultless life, then, or Gentiles who seemingly can obey the law even though they don't have it. So when you put all of this together, the question is now, how can we make sense of all of these statements? And so this is the challenge that is before us, right? It's theological because we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. We're looking not just at one passage of Paul, but we're trying to look at all of his letters. Now, granted, uh, most of his statements about the law fall in Romans and Galatians, but there are other scattered comments about the law in his other letters, too. But we're trying to develop, then, a coherent theology of Paul's thinking and reflections on the law. And so that's the challenge before us and to which we'll turn next.